Welcome back to the GO training. This is module 4.1, Case Management, Caring for Ebola Patients. The objectives of this module are threefold. By the end of the session, we want you to be able to identify the basic features of case management, describe how case management contributes to stopping Ebola, and be clear and identify how your work relates with the work others are doing in case management. Let's get going. Let me remind you of the four main pillars of Ebola outbreak response. Case management, if you remember, was pillar one. The next pillar and the pillars to follow are case finding and contact tracing, number two. Number three is safe and dignified burials. And number four, which cuts across all of the other response pillars, is social mobilization and community engagement. If you're ready, let's start. Why is case management so important? What is it? Case management involves providing safe care and treatment to patients to improve their survival and also to improve their comfort. We already know that early treatment increases the chances of survival dramatically. So it's very important that we get anyone who has Ebola, we get them treatment, supportive treatment and care. Doing work in this pillar reduces the spread of Ebola and it's fundamental to controlling this outbreak. Admitting patients in designated Ebola treatment facilities, we call these ETUs, Ebola treatment units, helps to prevent spread to family and community members. And it breaks the chain of transmission from one person to another. So you can see why case management is important for controlling the outbreak, but also absolutely important for the person who's sick with Ebola. The principles of case management. The basic underlying foundation is to provide safe and effective care. Case management protects the caregiver and caregivers have to follow infection prevention control guidance. Tragically, we saw many health workers, many caregivers die from Ebola. So this is a very, very important idea. The second is that case management provides effective care based on treatment guidelines. We already at WHO and others have treatment guidelines on how to treat anybody who is sick with a viral hemorrhagic fever, such as Ebola. Case management provides special populations with the specific needs they have. So, for example, children, pregnant women will need special care because they have special vulnerabilities. In case management, we look at treating patients not just with medical care, but to treat them with respect and dignity, even if they are terminally ill. Doing proper case management provides the necessary information and support to patients and families and friends. This is a very frightening time when your loved one who is sick with Ebola is taken in to an Ebola treatment unit. And it's not like any other hospital where you can visit your loved ones. We need to isolate these patients. So information and support to patients and families is very important. Proper case management provides proper discharge of advice and follow-up and in the case of death, follows the steps for safe and dignified burial. So you see, colleagues working in case management have to follow these principles and turn these into activities that help to give care to the patient and also stop the further transmission of this disease to others. Now, if you are going to be deployed as a caregiver, you will need to know that you can get infected while caring for patients. If you're not a caregiver, you need to know the kinds of pressures that our colleagues who are doing this job has. So all caregivers, whether they're in a treatment unit or a community care center or even at home, need to follow the infection prevention control guidance and the occupational health guidance that WHO has. Those involved in direct patient care need special training in infection prevention control. This training module, the GO training modules, are not sufficient to train you in infection prevention and control. Please remember this. Different categories of staff dif require different levels of personal protection, so follow the guidance. There are many levels of personal protection. Uh, anybody working in this area needs to 
closely follow hygiene guidance that we've talked about in other uh, modules. We need to understand cleaning and disinfection practices in treatment facilities, health facilities, hospitals, community care centres. And we need to understand and follow segregation of waste for proper disposal. This means how to properly get rid of waste and not mix it with non-contaminated waste. We need to provide effective care for patients. The initial steps in the facility are designed to have special procedures at entry and exit points. So whenever patients and people come in and whenever they leave these facilities and for patient care areas. And there are red zones and green zones and different policies. Green zones are zones in or at the entry or the exit where there is less chance of uh, transmission. And the red zone is where the patients are patients who are sick are. And there'll be different policies that have been set up for the green zone and the red zone, and we need to know about that. Patients reach facilities through efforts of epidemiological investigation and self-reporting. So because of epi investigation or because people have self-reported or their families have said, our loved one may have Ebola, that is how they get to the facility. And there is think called triage, uh, which is the first step done specifically by trained personnel. So trained personnel will look at the patient, listen to the history, look at uh, symptoms and signs and do laboratory diagnosis. And that is where triage, grouping of different patients is made. Based on the findings, the patient is either admitted into a designated area or asked uh, to take medication for some other illness they might have. So they receive treatment with care to prevent transmission to the care providers or to other patients. There's lab investigations to confirm the diagnosis and other tests to understand treatment needs. And the patient's uh, basic needs such as food, water, hygiene, cleanliness and emotional support will be taken care of. So this is for any person who is deployed to know and understand what happens when a patient uh, is cared for in a facility. So providing care, the next step is really diagnosing a case. Initially, we have experts and trained staff have what is known as triage algorithms. These are really decision-making tools and based on the history of contact and symptoms, patients are classified as either suspect of Ebola or probable cases. The symptoms we already know are diarrhea, vomiting, bleeding, fever, can also be due to other diseases as well. So it's very important to do this step. And But the real diagnosis can only be confirmed using a lab test. So we have suspect cases, probable cases, confirmed cases. Lab tests can take varied amounts of time based on where they are done and the, and the facilities available. Taking you through a little bit more into the treatment guidelines. The treatment guidelines looks at many areas of patient care. Supportive treatment. Remember we said that there isn't a cure yet for Ebola but there is treatment and with early treatment people survive much better. The mainstay of treatment is fluid and electrolyte balance. What does that mean? We have to restore the fluids, address dehydration of the patient, and make sure that the electrolytes that is required for this balance are given. This is life-saving and it is a must. Early rehydration, fluid and electrolyte balance, actually is very effective and it must be given in the adequate amounts. This can be given uh, as oral rehydration uh, fluids if it's mild, so the patient drinks it. And WHO recommends that we, and we have procedures for giving intravenously for others. This is very dangerous work again, and people who are doing this have to be trained. Other medications can be used, say for pain. This is a very painful condition to control vomiting, agitation. Uh, patients can be extremely agitated and to treat other symptoms. Also, many of these patients have other infections at the same time, like malaria, uh, such as sepsis. So these have to be treated. And if you're interested or if this is more your area of work, we've added the links that you need to get to the proper guidance that WHO has. I said earlier, special populations have special needs. Children need much closer supervision and they need psychological support from adults. Pregnant women, unfortunately, we know have 
die in higher numbers when they get Ebola. Most babies of mothers with Ebola die, either in the womb or soon after delivery. Fluids uh, for babies delivered can be ineffective. So all infection prevention, control preventions are needed. And tragically, abortion can happen, and abortion can be a sign of Ebola infection. We have to really remember that regardless of the state of seriousness of the illness, even if we think a patient is dying, we need to provide patient care with respect and dignity. We need to provide decent living conditions. We have to have a very good manner of talking, caring, helping. And this is very difficult because healthcare staff are also under pressure and in fear of their own lives. We need to not forget that people need food, water and other basic needs. They need information. They need to know what's going on. We need a way to talk with relatives, for them to communicate with relatives or for information about them to be uh, transferred to relatives. Community engagement and education is so important here. This allows families, loved ones to protect themselves, to reduce fear and anxiety. And when, if the treatment is, uh, if the supportive treatment is successful, when, when people survive Ebola, communities need to accept these survivors back. So all of this requires very intense work with community engagement. So you will see how the different pillars of response, in this case, case management and community engagement, are so closely intertwined. Again, we've included the link that you need to go into uh, if, in the case, a patient dies and we need to do safe and dignified burials in the event of death, again requiring full community participation. Another word about laboratory diagnosis. There are special considerations that have to be followed in specimen collection and transportation. Remember we said Ebola is spread through body fluids and the specimens are body fluids. The laboratory tests, there are many types of tests. Some of them are very quick, some of them take a little longer. Results have to be relayed back to the health worker so that they can manage the patient. The patient and the family has to be informed and and report to the authorities. Why? Because those people responding, the authorities and organizations like WHO, need to know where the disease is and, and we need really to know where the laboratory confirmed cases are so we can take all the measures, the full package of measures to stop transmission in this area and to prevent further death and disease. So the transmission of Ebola virus disease, let's do a little revision. The incubation period is 2 to 21 days. This is very important for case management. So if somebody has symptoms or has exposure, we need to watch them for at least 21 days. Exposure to blood or any other body fluid from a person with Ebola, a dead or alive, is a threat to healthcare workers, to family, to communities. So again, this has big implications for giving care. Risk groups, really high risk groups, include frontline health workers, family members, caregivers, traditional healers, and those participating in unsafe burials. Remember, if you are deployed as a frontline health worker or working in an Ebola treatment unit or any other facility or come into direct contact with somebody who might have Ebola, you need training, specialized training on how to protect yourself and prevent further transmission. So there are many challenges, and of course, wherever there are challenges, there are solutions. So provision of medical care to critically ill patients can be done, regardless of the difficulty and the challenges in any setting. And even in areas where this disease is now affecting, these three countries are not countries with a lot of resources, but proper medical care can be given. Healthcare workers have an obligation to provide the best possible medical care to improve survival and to relieve symptoms. And the World Health Organization particularly believes this. So we try to give the best care, including intravenous fluids, but we at the same time put in procedures, very strict procedures, to try and prevent the risk to healthcare workers. The application of appropriate skills and case management of protocols makes this care of patients more effective but also safer. So what are these uh, appropriate case management supports? If these things are done well, 
they support all other Ebola control measures. And ultimately, it saves lives, it improves comfort, it reduces transmission, it improves community confidence and support. So here we are. We've gone through an overview of why case management is important in Ebola response, how and what is case management, uh, albeit at a very high level, what are some of the challenges, and uh, what can be done to address these challenges. What I would like you to do now is take a few minutes and list how your work relates to or can contribute to the work in case management. Some of you may have a direct link to it. Some of you may have an indirect link to it. So think about all of the things we've discussed in this module and list how you and your work relate to case management. Also think about the way, the role you have in supporting colleagues who are working in this very high risk and intense area of Ebola support. I hope this module has been useful. Take time to have this final reflection and I will see you in the next module.